Welcome to our study in Revelation 18. Commercial Babylon destroyed. The two, when you put chapter 17 and 18, it talks about the, the, the destruction of Babylon, uh, com the complete destruction of Babylon. And that destruction will decisively rid the world of major evils that have plagued the human race for thousands of years. Now, in chapter 17, last week's session, we saw the, the, the destruction of religious Babylon, which took place at the midpoint of the tribulation period. Chapter 18 describes the destruction of the commercial or the governmental uh, system at, at the very end of the tribulation. Some scholars, Bible scholars and prophecy students, do not distinguish between these events as being two separate events, but rather they look at them as being, uh, they, they mold them together and look at them as one, one event. I'm, I'm of the school that believes that they are two separate uh, destructions involving two separate aspects of society that exist during the tribulation period. And there are six reasons why I think that. First reason, after, at verse 18, I mean, chapter 18, verse 1 begins by saying, after these things, talking about and indicating that nothing in chapter 18 can take place until all of the events of chapter 17 have been fulfilled. Second reason, verse 1 also says, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. The events in chapter 17 were introduced by one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls. This second angel is obviously not the same angel. He is another angel. Third difference that we see is that the, there are, the names of Babylon are different in the two chapters. Chapter 17 refers to Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, and of the abomination of the earth. In chapter 18, She's just simply referred to as Babylon the Great or the Great City. So the only similarity is the location for Babylon. For, well, that, that word is, it, is, it is the capital city of Satan's empire. Another reason why I believe it's separate events. For, first of all, in chapter 17, verse 16 just tells us that the religious Babylon was destroyed by the kings of the earth. But commercial Babylon of chapter 18 is destroyed by the cataclysmic judgments of God. Fifthly, in chapter 17, the kings who destroy religious Babylon rejoice. But in chapter 18, as the commercial Babylon is destroyed, the kings and the merchants and the sailors lament and weep. And then finally, the last reason, if both Babylons are destroyed at the end of the tribulation, there's absolutely no time for the Antichrist or the false prophet to do away with all of the other, all formal religion and substitute the worship of the Antichrist as being the official uh, religion. So for all those reasons, I believe that the, there are two different uh, destructions of two different systems taking place at two different times. So chapter 17 describes the destruction of religious Babylon at the midpoint, at the middle of the tribulation, and then chapter 18 describes the destruction of Satan's seat, the commercial and governmental city of Babylon at the end of the tribulation. All right, so with that said, let's look at the text itself. Now, as we follow along in a text, I'm not going to follow and go from verse 1 to verse 24. We're going to cover all those verses, but in different order. So follow along with me. First of all, we see the announcement of the destruction. In verse 1, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, and she has become a, a, 
a dwelling place of demons and a, pr a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. Now, he, he clearly identifies this as an, another angel. Whether this, this other angel is one of the seven who had the uh, angels who had the seven bowls, as in chapter 17, we're not told that. But it seems to be d d doubtful. This angel is, seems to be very distinctive. And it says in verse 1 that she had great power. She had great authority. Um, and, the, and the fact that the, just with, uh, with, with that angel's glory, with his glory, he illumined the entire earth. So I don't think it is, a, is one of the seven bowls. But what's more important is the message. The message of this angel cries out with a mighty voice is very straightforward. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Now, since this is talking about the destruction of a literal city, uh, the government and, ca and commercial capital of the world during the tribulation, the natural question is, where is that city? Now again, those who study Bible prophecy are not in agreement. There are, is a large school of thought that says that this is talking about Rome because it was the center of the Roman Empire. There are a, a small group who think that it's referring to New York City because New York City is the commercial and uh, center of the world today uh, as evidenced by Wall Street and everything else. Uh, and also because of the fact that it's the headquarters of the, of the United Nations. Others maintain that ancient Babylon will be rebuilt. Now, there are four, four very good reasons why uh, for, for believing that at Babylon must be rebuilt. And it all relates to Old Testament prophecies that concern the destruction of Babylon that was not fulfilled when ancient Babylon was, was destroyed in Daniel's day. First of all, Isaiah thir chapter 13 and 14 and Jeremiah chapters 50 and 51 describe the destruction of Babylon as being at the time of the day of the Lord. Now, if you, if you read those four chapters carefully, it re, it, they all reveal the, the destruction of Babylon, but it uses the law of double reference. And what I mean by that is, is that they refer to the overthrow of ancient Babylon at the end of Israel's 70th year of captivity. But it also talks about when it uses the expression, the day of the Lord, that's used throughout all scripture, and especially in Old Testament prophecy, as to be talking specifically about the tribulation period, when God's judgment is finally um, pronounced and carried out throughout the world. That's referred to as the day of the Lord. So these two chapters are saying that Babylon will be destroyed in the day of the Lord. So that, how is it possible then, if ancient Babylon has been destroyed, but the Babylon's going to be destroyed at the end of the tribulation at, in the day of the Lord, how is that possible? Well, the only way that's possible is Babylon has to be rebuilt. Secondly, the ruins of, of ancient Babylon have been used to build other cities. Over the centuries, at least six different cities have been built using the ruins of ancient Babylon in their buildings uh, or in their building process. The most notable of those cities, the one that ever, all of us would recognize today, is Baghdad, which is only 50 miles north of where ancient Babylon existed in the first place. Most of old Baghdad is built using ruins that were moved from ancient Babylon to what is now Baghdad. There were five other cities in history that have been built using the ruins of, ba of, of Babylon. But Jeremiah 51 verse 26 says, 
And they will not take from you, talking about Babylon, they will not take from you even a stone for a corner, nor a stone for foundations, but you will be desolate forever, declares the Lord. So if ancient Babylon was destroyed, and the ruins of those the, of, of ancient Babylon was used to build other cities, how can this prophecy be fulfilled? Well, the only way it can be fulfilled is for Babylon to be rebuilt and destroyed at the end of the Lord and then be desolate forever. Third reason why Babylon must be rebuilt. The prophecies of Jeremiah and Isaiah indicate, first of all, in Jeremiah 51.8, suddenly Babylon has fallen and has been broken. Isaiah 13.19, Babylon the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. History reveals that Babylon was never destroyed that way. Where is Sodom and Gomorrah? Where, where was it located? Anybody know? It wasn't near the garden. It wasn't far, all right. Where is it located today? Where is the site? What is the site today of Sodom? Well, well, before we ask that, we'll answer that question, what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? You know your Bible. It was totally and completely destroyed. Why was it destroyed? Because of how evil and wicked it was. Now, what did God do before he destroyed it? He said, he said get, get Lot and his family out of there. Get the righteous out of there. And And... Abraham and God talked back and forth and, and basically said, are you going to destroy a city if I can find all these righteous people in there? He said, if you can find them, I won't destroy it. But he didn't find them. He told them to get Lot out. And then he brought, brought down hail and brimstone and fire from, from heaven. Destroyed them completely and utterly. Correct? Mm -hmm. So where is Sodom and Gomorrah today? What was the site of Sodom and Gomorrah today is the bottom of the Dead Sea. Nobody since that day, way back in Genesis, however many thousands of years ago that was, nobody has inhabited Sodom and Gomorrah anymore. But this passage in Isaiah says that Babylon will be destroyed just as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. That hasn't happened yet, so how is it going to be possible for this prophecy to come true unless Babylon is rebuilt? The fourth and final prophecy. In Isaiah chapter 13, verse 20, it says the ruins of Babylon were never to be inhabited again. It will never be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation, nor will the Arab pitch his tent there, nor will shepherds make their flocks lie down there. Again, history reveals Babylon was never destroyed that way. So for all these reasons, I believe that Babylon will be physically be rebuilt. For several years, there have been overtures to, to move the facilities of the United Nations from New York to another location for lots of different reasons. Uh, that movement is gaining momentum. At the same time, the World Council of Churches and its ecumenical movement is moving toward amalgamating all of the major religions of the world, trying to get everybody to coexist and, and unite and be together. We've already seen, we, today, we already see economic decisions being made based on how it affects the worldwide economy. Uh, so we are seeing a move to a one-world government, a one-world religion, and a one-world economy. Sooner or later, and I believe it's just a matter of time, before they consolidate to a single spot. And then based on all those reasons, those prophecies I just gave you, I believe that spot will be Babylon. Bankers all over the world are going to be more than happy to finance the rebuilding of Babylon to be the greatest city in the world because it's going to be the headquarters 
of the one world government, the one world religion, and the one world economy, which is nothing but being the capital city of Satan's empire. Now, from a practical standpoint, before he met his demise, in whatever year that was, about 20 years ago, roughly, Saddam Hussein, when he was head of Iran, had already gathered over $1 billion and began the, re the rebuilding of ancient Babylon. It's already happening. People have been to the site. It's, it's going on. So, I believe that ancient Babylon will be rebuilt. It will be the focal point of of Satan's evil empire. It will be the government, religious, and commercial headquarters of the world during the tribulation period. Just as God chose Jerusalem to be his capital to save souls, Satan will choose Babylon as his capital to destroy them. As we talked about last week, Babylon's got a long history. We first read about it in Genesis when talking about the Tower of Babel. From the very beginning, Satan was involved in that. Satan had set up his headquarters in Babylon. Ancient Babylon was destroyed. When it was, he moved his headquarters to Pergamum. Then he moved it to Rome, where I think it is now. And during the tribulation, he will move it again to Babylon, where, as chapter 18 says, at the end of the tribulation, God will destroy it. So let's talk about this description. Uh, John hears another voice from he heaven telling why Babylon is to be destroyed. Pick it up and read in verse 5. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back even as she has paid, and give back to her double according to her deeds. In the cup which she has mixed, mix twice as much for her. To the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and I am not a widow, and will never see mourning. For this reason, in one day her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For the Lord God who judges her is strong. Now drop down to verse 21. And a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus will Babylon the great city be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. And the sound of harpists and musicians and flute players and trumpeters will not be heard in you any longer. And no craftsman of any craft will be found in you any longer. And the sound of a mill will not be heard in you any longer. And the light of a lamp will not shine in you any longer. And the voice of the bridegroom and bride will not be heard in you any longer. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all who have been slain on the earth. These two groups of verses tell us why and how Babylon is to be destroyed. Verse 5 refers to her many, many sins. So many, they piled up as high as the heavens. Verse 7 talks about her sensuous living, her arrogance, and her boastful pride of life. Instead of glorifying God, she glorified herself. Look at, look at what it said. It's, she said that, that I sit as a queen. I am not a widow. In that day, widows were considered to be weak, helpless, and completely dependent on God and others for their subsistence. What, what, what she's saying is, very smugly, I think, I sit as a queen. I mean, I don't need anybody. I'm in, I can take care of myself. What she was saying was, I don't need God. As Satan's empire, that's exactly, you know, this is, this is mimicking exactly what Satan said. Satan said, you're going to bow down, told God, you're going to bow down to me. That's exactly what Babylon is saying. Verse 24, 
condemns her because of all the death she caused to the prophets, to the saints, only because they had belief in God. So for all these reasons, she faces judgment. God knows all these things, and he remembered all of her sins and then gave her exactly what she gave others. She received a double portion of God's wrath and judgment. Um, that's exactly what she was saying when it said to, uh, to, give, to give her double. Verse 6 was telling us that. So that's a great reminder that we at all cost need to avoid what she was guilty of. Temptation which is common to all. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the prideful, uh, boastful pride of life. These verses also remind us we will reap what we sow, and then some. So the result is that Babylon will experience plagues, pestilence, death, and famine, Fires will completely consume her. All that's in verse 8. Verse 21 tells us that these horrors are going to be ushered in as a strong angel threw a millstone down from heaven with a great violence. And the result was total destruction. The city would no longer exist. The people would no longer exist. No, the sounds of normal living would no longer exist. Simply put, Babylon will not be found any longer. It will be completely destroyed. This darkness of what used to be the city of Babylon will be destroyed, perpetually uh, covering Babylon, in resulting in lifelessness for eternity. As I said a while ago, when God judged Sodom and Gomorrah way back in Genesis, they were never, they, they simply just never existed again. Exactly the same thing will take place when God judges Babylon, which is exactly what Isaiah prophesied centuries ago, that she would be destroyed just as Sodom and Gomorrah was. So the destruction is coming because of her evilness, because of her her, through her actions saying she doesn't need God and the judgment is coming and the judgment will be swift because it said in one day now how do the people of that day react to the destruction of Babylon that's what we find in verses beginning in verse 19 it describes the actions of three groups of people the kings of the earth the merchants, and then the sailors, as Babylon is destroyed. Let's read the verses and then come back and look at it. And the, Verse 9, And the kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city, Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore, cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and every kind of citron wood and every article of ivory and every article made from very costly wood and bronze and iron and marble and cinnamon, and spice, and incense, and perfume, and frankincense, and wine, and olive oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and cattle, and sheep, and cargoes of horses, and chariots, and slaves, and human lives. And the fruit you long for has gone from you, and all things that were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you, and men will no longer find them. The merchants of these things, who became rich from her, will stand at a distance because of her torment weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city, she who was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour such great wealth has been laid waste. 
and every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor and as many as make their living by the sea stood at a distance and were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she has laid waste. The kings of the earth weep and lament over Babylon when they see the smoke of her burning. That's what verse 9 tells us. And their great remorse is shown in verse 10. They stand at a distance and say, Woe, woe. They're truly saddened. They, they're acknowledging God's judgment of Babylon. But note how quickly God's judgment was carried out. All three groups make some reference to one hour. The kings of the earth are saying, for in one hour your judgment has come. Chapter, I mean, verse 11 begins talking about the merchants as they weep and mourn in, from chapter 11 through, through the first half of chapter 17 because no one buys their merchandise any longer. And they give a long list of all the things that they're, that they're no longer selling. Uh, now, let me start, ask you a question. Why, did, why do you think that the angel explained it to John and John wrote it down so we would know about the specifics of what they could? Could he have just said and the, the merchants couldn't sell anything? What are they saying? They're showing about all the, the things that the well-off, the rich are buying. Gold, silver, precious stone, silk, scarlet, citron wood, ivory, costly wood, cinnamon, spice, incense. All those were things of showing how luxuriously they had all been living. And the merchants were made rich from that. But now nobody buys anything. Everything has been completely taken away. And they are, they're mourning. It says again in verse 15, these merchants who became rich from her stand at a distance because of her torment, weeping and mourning. And again, they cry out, Woe, woe, the great city has been destroyed. But listen to what he says too. Again, acknowledging God. For in one hour, such great wealth has been laid waste. Then the shipmasters and the sailors and everybody who makes their living by the sea, they too stood at a distance and cried out, because they could no longer get rich off the seas and the waterways. They were mourning the loss of Babylon by throwing dust over their head. That's the same way as you read in the Old Testament of the Jews in mourning putting sackcloth and ashes on. They're, they're in deep mourning. For in one hour, she has been laid waste. All three of these groups were weeping and mourning as they watched the destruction of Babylon. But note it says in every one of those cases that all three of them were standing at a distance. Why? Because of their fear. They said, well, hey, it's being destroyed. Let me back up so I don't get it on me. <laughs> you know? But what stands out to me, it is them. It, well, it is them. Sure. Uh, what stands out to me is their lament seems to be for what they are losing. They don't seem to be too, in my reading, they don't seem to be too concerned that Babylon itself is being destroyed, but what they're losing. You know, the, 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 the kings were losing their sensuous lifestyle. The merchants and the seamen were losing their, their source of riches. They, every one of them made comment of that. But I want you to note something else. As they're watching from distance, as they are mourning, as they are in great fear, and they all acknowledge that God is the one that's doing it, wouldn't you think that would cause them to repent? But there's absolutely no record of that. All they did was lament. Their sensuous lifestyle is gone. Their source of riches are gone. And they again acknowledge 
that God is the one who's bringing the judgment. Because look at what it says in verse 20. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. So even acknowledging, even acknowledging that God is the one pronouncing judgment, absolutely no record of their repentance. So what does that mean? That means soon they too will face judgment because every one of us will enter into judgment. Those who know Jesus as Lord and Savior will enter into eternity in heaven. Those who don't will enter into eternity in hell. Now, I have purposely left out a verse. Anybody pick up on which one it was? 20. Nope. 21. Nope, wasn't that? It go all the way back. It was verse 4. I purposely left that out to the very end. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins and that you may not receive her plagues. I heard another voice from heaven come out of her, my people, so that you may not participate in her sins and that you may not receive her plagues. Who are these people? They're referred to as my people. So obviously this voice is either the voice of Jesus or the voice of God. Who are these my people? Well, obviously that's the tribulation saints. Um, now at this point in time, at the end of tribulation, there's not many tribulation saints left. Most of them have been martyred. And I do have to, uh, j just in case for those who are listening, tribulation saints are those people who at the rapture of the church were not believers and they were left behind. But during the tribulation, they did not take the mark of the beast, but rather they accepted Jesus Christ to be their Lord and their Savior. They are God's people. They are Christian. They are believers. And they are the ones that are being, refer being, being told to come out of Babylon. Now, i got to be honest with you. I cannot imagine how they are surviving in Satan's capital without having the mark of the beast. Because as we studied several chapters ago, without the mark of the beast, there could be no selling, no buying, no trade, no nothing. But yet somehow... They refuse to bow, to bow their knee to Antichrist, and they are truly children of God. So they, that's my people. But there's another group of people that this may be referring to. And who is, who is from the beginning of creation, who has been God's chosen people? The Jews. Always were, always have, always will be. When he says, come out of her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins and that you may not receive her plagues, it is also very possible that there are still Jews in Babylon. There are going to be lots of Jews in Babylon who have not yet made a decision. They have, they have not taken the mark of the beast because once you take the mark of the beast, as we studied in, in previous session, you forever cast your lot for eternity. They have not taken the mark of the beast, but by the same token, they have not yet accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. God, again, has given them one more chance to, pull, to come out, to repent. The angel is calling them out before it is too late. Just as God called his Lot and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah before that city was totally destroyed, God always calls his people to turn to him. This call of God to people at the end of the tribulation is just one more example of His grace and mercy. His desire is that no one would partake in the sins of Babylon, and therefore they would all be spared from, the, from her plagues. But if they do not come out, they will be judged accordingly. If they participate 
in the sins of Babylon, if they participate by taking the mark of the beast, they will be judged accordingly. But if they turn to him in repentance, they will experience the grace and mercy of God. Here's the good news. God's grace and mercy is still available today. In every age, he receives everybody, every single one who, who is willing to repent of their sins and look to him for reconciliation through his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross just for that reason, to pay the penalty for our sins. And he rose from the dead so that we too could have a resurrected life and be forever reconciled to God. My question simply is, have you done that? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? He says, come out of her, my people. Today, he says exactly the same thing. Come out of the world, my people. Be reconciled. Come unto me. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Jesus wants every one of us to turn to him in salvation. Have you done so? If you choose not to, just remember what R.G. Lee, the great preacher of a prior generation, said, there is a payday someday. Only those who have called upon the name of the Lord will be spared from the damning judgment of God that comes upon all sinners. Will that be you? Questions? Comments? Religious Babylon is destroyed. The only event that's left now is the battle of the Armageddon. But folks, we're rapidly approaching the point where Jesus comes back. And next week, that's exactly what we're going to look at. We're going to look at what's taking place in heaven while all this judgment was taking place down on earth. We're going to talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then we're going to be talking about the actual second coming of Jesus Christ. We want you to be part of it. Won't you join us?